Coming up next, Dr. Susan Linquist and Danielle Jaros explain how the environment can drive evolution at the molecular level. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Futures in Biotech is provided by CashFly at CashFly.com. This is Futures in Biotech, Episode 77, How the Environment and a Single Protein Influence Evolution. I believe that biotech is the next frontier. Probably the greatest intellectual revolution that's ever taken place uh, in man's history. DNA is the code for life. We're actually beginning to understand how life works, which I think is something that's mind-blowing in and of itself. There was uh, going to be a genetic component to aging. How long was there going to be the extension? About 30, 40 percent for humans. That would be way to something like 20 to 30 years. How close are we to actually having a therapist? Ballpark, 10 years. It's potentially one of the things that might be rocking the world the same way that uh, people said, oh, the sun is the center of the universe, so oh, this and that and everything. And now here's somebody who can come out and say, hey, look, here's how we compare it to our closest evolutionary relative. Welcome to Futures in Biotech. Uh, our first guest today, uh, Dr. Susan Linquist, is one of the few cellular and molecular biologists that truly extends the range of her scientific inquiry beyond the fundamental questions of who we are and how we are made. Her work also seeks to understand how we got here and where we are going. She guides her team through the science of human disease and anti-infectives, uh, amyloids and neurodegeneration, prion biology, and even evolution in cancer. She's a member of the f and former director of the Whitehead Institute and professor of biology at MIT, an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. She's a member of the National Academy of Arts and Sciences and the National Academy of Sciences, winner of numerous prizes, including the Otto Warburg Prize, the Dixon Prize in Medicine, the Max Delbruck Medal, the Mendel Medal. And in 2010, she was awarded the National Medal of Science by President Obama. Um, also with us today, we have uh, Dr. Daniel Jarose a uh, postdoctoral fellow in the Linquist Lab at the Whitehead Institute at MIT. He and Dr. Linquist authored a groundbreaking paper in science that was published on Christmas Eve of the, uh, last year, entitled, HSP-90 and Environmental Stress Transform the Adaptive Value of Natural Genetic Variation. Welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you. It's here. good to be here. It's a real honor to have you on uh, to talk about this work, because this, this is a... Uh, this is one of those transformative uh, papers, I think. Um, and it was well, this year's transformative paper out of the Linquist Lab. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> thank I'm you a huge so fan much. of your work. Oh, yeah. thank you, um, for the audience, well, I'm um, delighted if you to have the opportunity to introduce you to J Dan because he's really just a spectacular postdoc in my lab and just uh, has done a brilliant job on this piece of research. Um, yeah, welcome, Dan. It's nice to meet you. Yeah, good to meet you. Um, now you're officially a twit <laughs> this weekend. Um, so, yeah, and Dr. Linquist has been on the show uh, on, as episode one, of course, right, yeah. uh, episode one, our favorite, uh, my favorite scientist on episode one. So, uh, and Fib 57, and now this is Fib 77. So if you want to get a little bit of a background uh, of Dr. Linquist's work, you can uh, tune into those shows and get um, an idea of how the work has progressed over uh, uh, the past four years. It was in 2006, so almost five years. Um, so the paper uh, that you guys are going to present really, um, I, I guess, it, it, you, if I read just the first line of the paper, um, it, it asks one of the most fundamental uh, questions in life. And, it, and you state the question, how can species remain unaltered for long periods, yet also undergo rapid diversification? Maybe you could explain the question, and then uh, we can start the conversation there. Well, there are some uh, wonderful examples of, uh, of biology where the very same uh, looking species has been around. And Dan often shows a, a picture, for example, of a, of a ginkgo tree. And going back many, many, many hundreds of millions of years, that ginkgo tree, at least from the fossil record, looks a lot like it, it looks now. But then there are other cases and other times and places where uh, it's, it's quite clear that species have diversified very rapidly. And, and there are many well-known examples of that. There are some lakes in Africa where 
um, there was a sudden cataclysmic change and the lake got sealed off and the, the, the fish that uh, diversified in that lake, or you, you know exactly when that lake formed and, and, and what the fish were like when they first got in there and then they just diversified into th thousands of species. Same thing happened with fruit flies on the Hawaiian Islands and there, there's, there's several other examples of that where really very, very different forms and functions developed you know, in the course of, of really tens of thousands of years to, to, um, to, to maybe a, a you know, long time scale for those kinds of diversifications are about a million years. So how, how this can happen, how you can have very, very rapid evolution, but also keep forms and functions the same for very long periods of time uh, is, is, a, is a very interesting question. And that's one that uh, Dan decided to tackle in a molecular terms uh, at, at a level that we, we had we'd approached it um, really genetically uh, and uh, at, a, at a rather primitive molecular level in uh, fruit flies and in Arabidopsis previously. And we dabbled in a little, some aspects of, of the evolution of cancer and some aspects of the evolution of drug resistance and fungi. But Dan decided to just take the question and put an entirely uh, quantitative, well-grounded molecular explanation on it. That's, um, it's kind of ambitious to try and uh, really put a molecular finger, <laughs> an atomic <laughs> finger, on such a fundamental process of life that has, you know, such wide, uh, um, uh, you know, implications. So, Dan, maybe you could tell us... Uh, First, what made you uh, decide that this was your project that you wanted to, uh, to postdoc on? Yeah, so actually I did my PhD on uh, mechanisms that regulate how mutations are formed in cells. Um, and, and just at the end of my time uh, uh, working on that project, a few experiments kind of led me to realize that, you know, a lot of mutations are made that don't really have any phenotypic consequence. Um, and so ultimately, natural selection is working, working on phenotypes rather than, than genotypes. Uh, and, you know, I'd been aware of Sue's work uh, and, you know, went and, and just chatted with her informally first and I was really blown away by what an amazing environment the lab was. Um, and I really wanted to get at this question of, you know, could you have stored genetic variation that you know, could be either released or concealed uh, depending on the environment? And uh, sort of at the same time, a bunch of resources were coming available in yeast, uh, both with just sequenced natural strains and genetic techniques that made us really come to the conclusion that it, it might be possible to tackle this kind of a question in a way that hadn't been possible before. Perhaps you could just briefly explain the difference between phenotype and genotype. That way right, we're right. going to have a solid basis here. Yeah, so the, uh, you know, the genotype, right, is the, in the genetic code. So that's, you know, what, with these four letters, A, T, G, and C, um, that we hear so much about. But, you know, ultimately that's not what makes us who we are, right? Um, we're, we're made, that, that is, is, uh, is well, largely driven by proteins. And, um, you know, phenotype, it's the, the trait that's uh, what, what you select. So, you know, in, in Darwinian selection, what you have um, is that, you know, fitter individuals win, right? Uh, and, you know, it's, it's not really, the, the, the selection itself is happening on a, a trait, the, the phenotype that's expressed mm -hmm. in, in those individuals. It's, it's ultimately often linked back to a genotype, um, but it's really operating on, on the trait. So it's the combination of uh, what genes are turned on, basically. Uh, in a sense, right, yeah. And, uh, you know, this really what's so exciting about this work is that it provides a, a molecular mechanism through which genetic variation might either have a phenotypic output or not, um, depending on the environment. So it's, uh, yeah, it's important to say, Mark, actually, that it's not just about what genes are turned on or off. It's whether those genes, when they're on, have a particular biological effect. And the, the interesting aspect of this is that um, uh, we, the cells are just incredibly, incredibly crowded. And uh, what basically has to happen in order to get a biological trait is that the genetic code has to be uncoded and into proteins. Basically, that's what most of the genetic code is doing is, is making proteins. And proteins do just about everything in you from, um, you know, they're, they're the muscles that power your, your arms and they're the, the pigments in your eyes that perceive light and they, they digest your food. They d just do just about everything in us. And um, those, that code, that, that process of translating that DNA code into a protein which has to fold into a very specific shape in order to function um, 
is actually profoundly influenced by the environment. And uh, one of the reasons for that is that cells are just really crowded. They're jam-packed full of proteins. And so uh, when the, there's a change in the temperature or if there's a change in the amount of water in the cell, like with the osmotic stress, or if there's a change in pH or lots of different very minor changes that you would think of as, as, as not really having a big effect in this incredibly crowded, crowded cell where proteins are jostling about and next to each other all the time, it can have a big effect on the functionality of those proteins. And so that's basically what this is all about. It's, it's how the functions of those proteins, which, which actually create the biological traits, are manifested. Um, they, they, they're, of course, all those proteins are encoded by the DNA, but whether or not they will wind up having one biological effect or a different biological effect will really also be influenced by the environment. And so we're, we're kind of um, placing a, uh, an actually logical framework on something that Lamarck had, had postulated a long time ago, that, that uh, the process of evolution is influenced by, by environmental change, and envir driven by environmental forces. And it all, back you know, in the 1930s when um, Jansky was reformulating the, the modern synthesis of, of evolution, and he was trying to say, okay, we've got Darwin and we've got uh, natural selection, and now we've started to have genetics, and we, we need to put these together and, and formulate the, a new framework for understanding evolutionary biology. He was, he was just an absolute giant in the field. But uh, when he was asked to consider not whether or not the environment might influence the inheritance of a trait, he thought it was just, it was just ridiculous. Um, but we're actually coming to learn that it's, it's not so ridiculous. There's actually some natural very simple molecular explanations how the environment will determine whether or not the DNA is manifested as having one phenotypic trait or another, and then whether or not a change in that DNA will have a, a, a phenotypic trait or biological trait or a different biological trait. And therefore, um, the environment, in, in, the, in, in a changed environment, uh, natural selection will act, uh, will favor one piece of DNA versus another depending upon the environment. If, if I understand it correctly, well, this is a, a gross oversimplification here. You know, Mendel sort of pieced together the concept of inheritance through uh, the, the, the idea of a gene, right, with his work mm -hmm. on peas. And then, you know, Darwin sort of, uh, I guess Darwin before that, uh, was sort of piecing together, well, an organism can adapt to a new environment and the organisms that have the, the specific traits that are best suited for that new ecosystem will thrive and uh, pass on their genes. And then you're saying that the environment can actual, actually um, have an influence on the speed or the rate of evolution as well. That's right, because it's, it's not just that you, you have to wait for a new mutation to have, have a new, new biological trait. You can actually accumulate a lot of these uh, what we would call polymorphisms or variations in the genetic code and a, a population of organisms will have each diff in, different individual will have um, lots of different changes uh, between one individual and another in their genetic code and um, they might all look exactly the same at any one point in time then the environment changes and because the um, these little genetic mutations that they have in them influence the ways in which the proteins fold and the proteins fold are influenced by the environment uh, that will determine how natural selection will will act on on, on taking that genetic variation and now making it rapidly um, cause new traits because you can have lots and lots of hidden genetic variation in your genome and you that you would never know it until the environment comes around and says and stresses the 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 proteins, and then uh, certain individuals that have certain genetic variants in them will wind up having a, an entirely new kind of biological trait. And um, then, then natural genetics and selection can act upon that to cause those that genetic variation to be enriched in the next generation. Dan also really found a that paradigm shift, isn't it? It, it? it was it's a pretty big one, I think. Yeah, it's it's uh, but it's it's actually it's it, you know. In the earlier days when we didn't know how sensitive proteins were to the environment, it, you'd, it would have just been kind of impossible to formulate this. And we're, we've been greatly aided by the fact that uh, molecular biologists and biochemists have really started to understand in a living cell the extraordinary problems that proteins fold, face in folding. And so there's this buffering idea uh, that, that you can have a lot of variation that's, that's hidden 
because of protein folding and problems and, uh, and, and brought to the surface by protein folding problems. But Dan also found that, uh, that there's an equally strong component in which you can have new mutations that immediately exert an effect because of uh, the, uh, there's a protein folding buffer in there that helps the proteins fold. And then if the environment changes, you lose that biological trait. And maybe, Dan, you might want to tell them a little bit about, about uh, how you went about looking at those traits. Yeah, so I mean, but basically what we did is uh, look at, we use advances in high throughput uh, biology. They're, they're really aided us, right? So we have you know, robots uh, and, and plasticware that can help us grow um, these individuals in, in high throughput. So we took strains from around the world there, um, yeast isolates from wine, from you know, the bark of trees, from soil you name it, uh, infected human patients even. Um, so, you know, a few hundred of these. And then in quadruplicate, we grew them in little tiny wells uh, in, in plastic dishes and then monitored their growth over, over time. Uh, and we did that in a uh, hundred odd different growth conditions. Um, you know, you, you know, just like a different difference in pH, we got salts, uh, you know, clinic drugs that are used clinically. Um, the idea is we just, they're, they're perturbations. Um, and, and then... This was all service here, by the way? Uh, yeah, they're all they're all wild isolates and services. Um, and so then we uh, yeah, so we did the same experiment in parallel, but we reduced this HSP90 um, buffer a little bit, right? So um, we have two natural product inhibitors, and what's nice about that is it lets us titrate in the amount of uh, of reduction that we want. So we chose a level that didn't affect normal growth, so we really were you know leaving much of HSP90 function intact, but just getting rid of this this extra bit that's there. Um, you know, Let's explain that. We should probably yeah, you could, yeah, explain the buffer. Yeah. <laughs> so, explain so the buffer because this is the molecular key. This is the big, this yeah, is huge, right? right? right. What and is I mean, HSP90 and uh, why would you want to turn it down? Yeah, I mean, so HSP90, right, it's a, it's a molecular chaperone, right? But it's, among chaperones, it's kind of unusual. So uh, yeah, we often wait, wait, think wait. about this. I think you have to explain what a chaperone is. <laughs> Yeah. It's, it's, okay. so let me now step in and explain what a dad. chaperone is. Um, My dad's listening, a, so we'll A chaperone is a protein that helps helps other proteins to mature properly. And so it's kind of like a human chaperone in many ways in terms of its function. It's reminiscent <laughs> of that. And so when proteins are, are first being made, uh, they come out as these long strings of amino acids, uh, just like the genetic code is a long string of, of DNA. And they have to fold, as I mentioned, into these very specific shapes. And uh, they can uh, sometimes get into trouble and interact with each other inappropriately before they finish folding. And so these things called chaperones actually come along and they bind them, and these immature species of proteins that haven't finished folding, and they prevent them from making inappropriate liaisons, if you will, and uh, until the protein matures and finishes folding. And so HSP90, and then when, when the protein has matured, it lets go and lets the, the protein go about its own business. And so it's, it's, those are called chaperones. And HSP90 is a, a particularly interesting one of these chaperones because it works on key regulatory pathway uh, proteins that, that send organisms down different developmental pathways or allow them to grow under conditions they otherwise wouldn't grow or give them new types of biological traits. And so it's helping to fold some of the most important proteins in, in the cell and can there, therefore can act as a, as a major switch in terms of whether um, how genetic variation will, will wind up playing out into a difference in protein folding. So Dan, take it away. <laughs> yeah, so right, I, I mean, I'm a, so that's what a chaperone is, right? And among let me, chaperones... Before, let, let me just see if I, I understand it and then, then we'll, we'll go with the, the yeah. next step. So HSP90 for heat shock protein 90, mm -hmm. Uh, yes. Is a, a protein. I guess it was originally found uh, in a screen for for cells that were uh, proteins that were expressed during heat shock. When you stress the cells out, it goes and grabs nascent proteins or, or stabilizes the other proteins in the cell, preventing them from cooking from heat and other environmental stresses. I guess you can cook in vinegar as well. But, <laughs> so it stabilizes the cell and sort of like a babysitter makes holds the hand of all the proteins. But HSP90, it, it seems to be acting on very important metastable molecular switches in the cell that channel information. Is that Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Critical point, Mark. Thank you very much right. for stepping in there. Okay. Yeah. And so you know, it's a combination of this, right? Plus the fact that there is a lot more of it than you normally need. And this is still a mystery to us why, why this may be. And you know, perhaps it's, it's for these, these properties of evolvability. But uh, there's a lot more HSP90 around. 
then you need for normal growth. And you can, you can dial it down to maybe 5% of normal levels in yeast and still have pretty, pretty normal growth. You do need it when you're under uh, proteotoxic stress, but, but normal growth is fine. And so so that actually, that's okay. Just let me let me make one quick thing. <laughs> that was that. That's key. What Dan just said is that we can experimentally dial it down with the drug, but we think in nature, what's happening is that its functionality is being used up by by environmental stress. So you don't need much of it normally, but when when you, the organism is stressed, all of a sudden you really need it a lot, and then you the the, the protein folding, the needy proteins actually use it up. So we experimentally manipulate in the laboratory with this drug what we think is happening in nature all the time with environmental change. So go ahead, exactly. Dan. Yeah, exactly. And so um, the right, so you, you can dial it down a lot. And this excess capacity can exert a really profound effect on genetic variants, right? So, and they're, they're twofold, right? One is this um, case of buffering where HSV90 serves as a capacitor and you can think of it much like a capacitor storing charge, except in this case, you're storing the phenotypic or the, the output in terms of traits of genetic variation under the hood. Uh, and so the, basically new, new variants can accumulate over time, but they won't have any phenotypic consequence until that buffer uh, is compromised and their phenotypes or their traits are released and you see an increase in phenotypic diversity. Uh, and then as Sue alluded to earlier, there are other variants that uh, instead rely on that excess capacity in order to fold and exert their function. Uh, and you know, th these cases, uh, you know, there are many, many mutated oncogenes that uh, behave this way. And also we've seen that uh, HSV90 profoundly enables the acquisition of antibiotic resistance uh, in fungal pathogens. So broadly, wow. these are the two, the two frameworks that, that we see. Um, but when we started the work, you know, really very little was known about the underlying basis of either phenomenon. Um, there had been you know, some controversy about whether it was epigenetic or genetic in nature. Um, and you know, the adaptive value uh, it, it was unclear. So you know, certainly for the, the fungal pathogen, you know, acquiring resistance to a, a, some drug use clinically is, is, is adaptive. Um, but if you look at you know, others of the traits, it, it's unclear whether um, this played an important role in evolution or was just a, a very interesting hypothesis. Uh, and we really wanted to tackle that in a, a satisfying way. And right. I hope we've done so. <laughs> Yeah, Mark, Mark, you might remember that I think that the original uh, interest that you had in this was due to some work we'd done in fruit flies where we saw these all of these crazy different variants with different shaped legs and wings and eyes and all sorts of other things that were, were manifested when the, the buffer of HSP90 was, was altered. But, but we were just, in, and it was really exciting how many different traits uh, uh, we, we saw. Uh, in response to environmental stress and how they could actually become fixed by genetic breeding and selection. But we were kind of just flailing around and waving our hands about actually how it worked. And so what, what Dan did in this paper was to really take an organism that is the best understood organism on the planet where we know we have the sequence of you know, 76 different genetic strains that he was looking at. We had the sequence of every single nucleotide in the in the in the cell, and so he could really relate the changes that he was seeing and whether whether a cell could grow in a certain sugar or not grow in a certain sugar. He could relate that to the actual changes in the in the DNA, and the effect of temperature on whether or not that change in DNA mattered. Yeah, precisely. Mm -hmm. And this is actually a, a fabulous research. I mean, you know, it's one thing I, I didn't even realize that, you know, until I started. But, you know, these strains uh, of yeast are actually as divergent in the sequences of their, their genomes as are you and, you and I. Um, so there's actually a lot of genetic diversity harbored in this, this set of, uh, of individuals that we looked at. And so um, what we found in this experiment where we grew, you know, hundreds of strains uh, with all kinds of genetic diversity and hundreds of different growth conditions um, was that uh, when we repeated that, but instead we got rid of this excess HS290 buffer or reservoir, uh, we saw phenotypic variation that, that occurred. So usually there was no effect, but always for every given condition and for every given uh, individual, there was always an effect uh, of HSV90 inhibition. So you could see, you know, for example, one individual might be able to grow a little bit better uh, in ethanol stress, or one individual might be able to grow a little bit better in salt stress, um, or one individual might grow a little bit worse in an antibiotic stress. And um, you know, what we found was that the changes occurred uh, in both directions. So sometimes reducing this reservoir of HSV90 function made an individual do better, sometimes it made it do worse. Uh, and overall, they 
roughly cancel out, the effects could be huge, right? They could range from, you know, a modest, you know, 20% effect um, to even an order of magnitude, so, you know, a tenfold difference in growth rate. Um, and, you know, for, for evolution, you know, it's even a 1% difference in, in fitness has an enormous impact over time. And every individual, these different strains were affected in different ways. So when, right. one, in one cell type, because of one genome, if you uh, gave it, asked it to grow in a certain sugar, and then str either reduce the HSP90 buffer or, or just simply grew it at high temperatures, one strain would suddenly be able to acquire the ability to grow in that sugar, and then another strain doing the same manipulation would that used to be able to grow in that sugar would lose the ability to grow. So it was just an amazing diversity of, of uh, genetic biological traits. I, I, I remember a talk, I, th I, think, I think it was in 2000 at Cold Spring Harbor where you presented some data on HSP90 and that was the one where the slide kept growing in terms of numbers of uh, phenotypes of fruit flies. Yes, so you right. titered out uh, HSP90. And this is, uh, you know, at the end, the, it was a crescendo of <laughs> slide backgrounds showing, I think, 150 different flies uh, that had, you know, uh, displayed uh, um, a phenotypic change. Right, um, and what was, so what was, it was cool, it was very different variants, but the, the, the difficulty, it was, it was exciting work, I think. I was excited about it anyway, but the, it, it was not easy to tell whether or not that would actually ever be a force in evolution because a lot of those forms and functions were kind of bizarre. So what Dan was able right. to do was actually, well, the reason the paper has this title, Adaptive Value, was to show that it really mattered whether or not those cells were going to survive it really mattered. They could grow in certain places they otherwise couldn't grow. They could, it, it, it just changed their ability to live and survive and to pass on their traits to their progeny. And that's, that's what evolu evolution has to be acting on, is, is the ability of an organism to pass on a genetically encoded trait to its progeny. And, um, and Dan basically showed across hundreds of traits and hundreds of strains that this, this amazing amount of genetic diversity was encoded in those genomes in ways that the environment w would uh, influence whether it, whether it uh, played out. And you, you said you titered down the, uh, the, the, the evolutionary buffer, HSP90 or capacitor, um, by t with, a, with a drug. Um, but right, yeah. did you did it? Does did the same effects occur to the same intensity yeah, so we, with uh, we, thirty-seven degrees or you know high temperature? Did you yeah, do that? Yeah, this is the, one of the so most striking things. And we, you know, these when you think about it, these natural products are structurally distinct, but they've been crafted by you know eons of evolution to fit, fit very tightly into the, uh, the active site of HSP ninety, and they, they inhibit it beautifully. That the fit is really stunning, um, and. It, you know, we did the same experiment uh, with, with temperature. We just you know, grew the wild strains across all the growth conditions at, at 39 degrees. And what's astonishing is that really most of the changes that we saw with very specific uh, inhibition of HSV90 were recapitulated simply by growth at elevated temperature. Uh, and I think that's one of the, the most exciting take home messages here actually is that uh, really natural proteotoxic stresses that occur in the environment are sufficient to produce most of the phenomena that we saw in the laboratory. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out, you know, exactly how you um, went about to measure the 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 phenotype the, the the various phenotypes um, on such a wide scale. How many how many different like uh, media did you try the cells? So you, you had cells that did not grow on one type of right. media, and then they had the ability to grow. Then you had uh, certain that could grow in I guess high temperature, low temperature, or in the presence of an antibiotic, or um, what other environmental stresses or, or new environments? Maybe you could. Uh, Maybe I have to listen to this show again twice because uh, <laughs> often I do. <laughs> you you um, know what? I just realized it would have been, been a great idea to have just had a couple of pictures to show. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. That's yeah, okay. It's, it's very hard to explain. The, 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 there are these what we call little... Uh, plates that have little plastic plates that have all these little tiny little wells in them and you fill them with cells and each each well had a different different genetic backgrounds. So in other words, one well, in one well it came from soil, in another well it came from wine, in another well it came from uh, a fig. So all these, these, these were Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is, as you know, Mark, is, is the best understood genetic organism on earth. Um, but they were all different strains from different wild environments. 
and then we simply grew them in, in incubators under under these uh, variety of different conditions and a variety of different media and so Dan had stacks and stacks and stacks of these plates with all different where the cells were the same cells were growing in in one carbon source or another carbon source or nitrogen source or in the presence of antibiotic or under oxidative stress or, or all sorts of things and so we could compare in a, in a in a plate from well to well to well how how well the cells were growing and it had to be transmitted across generations and generations and generations because we only put a small he only put a small number of cells in those wells and you only got growth you know after you only could see the growth after many many generations so it was clearly that the cells were inheriting the capacity oh, ah, right. that's that's a that's what that's the perfect that's <laughs> very good you guys you got a good crew there so those are the types of uh, <laughs> yeah exactly and so you can just tell well, I mean, the, the well looks turbid um, when, the, when the cells grow, uh, whereas if, they're, if they didn't grow well, uh, the suspension is clear. So on the surface of it, it's a very simple assay, but we just multiplex it a lot. So we have hundreds and hundreds of these plates. And, you know, in total, we measure maybe 100,000 uh, or more um, individual wells. Wow. And then he would do that at <laughs> HSP90 inhibited or not inhibited, and some cells that used to be able to grow could no longer grow and other cells that had been uh, not been able to grow now could grow and um, in, in, in every condition he looked at all over the map the different cells depending upon their genotype different cells were changing in different ways and they changed either with HSP90 specifically being changed or just by the simple environmental stress of, of increasing the temperature. Yeah, and, and the difference between the strains really uh, like pointed immediately to the, the genetic variation. And um, so we used a, a, a cross between two sequence strains that had been pioneered previously um, by Leonid Krugliak's lab. And it was a fantastic resource because what it allowed us to do was look at basically a family of yeast um, where the sequences of the parents were known, and we knew um, how those were recombined in all the progeny. So there are um, over 100 progeny children, basically, from this, this cross. And we basically know what their genomes look like. And we can array them in the, these same plates. We put you know, one, one sibling in one well and put them all next to each other. Uh, we grow them m multiple times, and then we look and see, OK, so you know, if, can you grow better in salt when we add HSP90 or not? Uh, and then if so, how does that correlate to uh, which uh, parts of the genome you inherited from parent, one parent versus the other? Uh, and what we found was quite striking, and that is that uh, HSP90 caused huge changes in what portions of the genome contributed to traits. Um, so this and, and the change in phenotype was not just uh, a, a sort of genetic memory the, the cells had the ability to adapt to all these different environments, but there was they were undergoing genetic change in the response to a lowered, uh, you know, uh, evolutionary capacitor of HSP90. Not really. No, the the genetic change. So we we would grow the cells again and again and repeat the experiments and repeat the experiments and had the same results over and over again. So that told us actually that it wasn't due to new mutations. We think HSP90 can also have a really big effect on the <laughs> the, the effects of new mutations. But what it was doing was it was it was taking a genome that that preexisted and altering whether altering how the proteins folded and therefore whether or not they would have a particular trait. And so then what Dan did was to go from fear so first he went from all these wild strains and was just showed that just this vast amount of genetic variation that exists in the wild is affected uh, by the environment this way and by HSP90 in this way. Then he went into these two these two individuals that had this that, that were crossed together and looked at all their progeny so he could map out he mapped out 400 uh, genetic traits and then looked at it found that there were a hundred of them were affected by by HSP90 and the, and the environment and then the the tour de force piece of this whole thing was he then took the individual genetic segments that he could tell oh, there's something in this segment of DNA that's that's varying that's causing a difference in growth depending upon the environment or depending upon HSP90 what the heck is it? So he then went out and dissected, went marched through the entire genetic interval and dissected piece by piece by piece, small little pieces of DNA, and exchanged them in different different uh, strains to pin down the exact segment of DNA that was responsible for the for that difference in in, in the ability to grow. So now instead of being some mysterious kind of hand waving that changes and produces a really weird looking eye or a really weird looking leg or a really strange looking wing or 
whatever. And we did this in Rabidopsis too. We found different leaf patterns and different root patterns, all sorts of different things. But we didn't know what they were based upon. And um, we didn't know whether they actually would, would help the organism grow better or not under some circumstance. So here he... He shows that it's wide-ranging genetic variation uh, and all kinds of natural genetic variation that it actually, many of these things actually very strongly help the organism to grow. And he pins it down to specific individual segments of DNA. So we can now start to really understand at a molecular level how, this, how these transformations take place. So that's, that's a, amazing. I, I think it was a pretty amazing piece of work that he did, I think. Well, and a lot of a lot of time at the bench. There's I mean, a lot of work that there's not secure, but it's very exciting, oh, sorry, right? And I mean, I think you know the, the key about this, right, is that at long last we're able to really ascribe, you know, a, a change in a trait that is dependent on this you know, really exciting HSP90 buffer uh, to individual genetic variants. And so, as Sue says, is correct. We can really now study how pathways are transformed uh, by this by the chaperone and how that influences the ability of organisms to adapt to new new environments what uh, I really, really love about what Dan did here was that he had this very big, broad overview, We're looking at all these wild strains and all this nat natural genetic variation, and he went from that to, to careful dissection of genetic traits in two individuals, and then to actually understanding the individual little molecular uh, piece of DNA that was responsible for the trait. So pretty big scale. <laughs> That he yeah, well, then we that. went back out, right? And this is I mean, what, what this got us to asking is, well, could we see a signature of this kind of an effect, you know, broad scale across these genomes? And uh, as, as Susan mentioned earlier on, um, you know, the, the, the genomes are known for many of these wild strains that we, that we studied. Um, and what had also been reported in those in initial studies was that if you look at the similarity um, in, in phenotypes or just across many different conditions of growth, uh, you look at just cluster the relationships of the strains. You look and see which what which, what does the sake strain look like? Does it grow like another sake strain, or does it grow like you know, a strain from a human patient? Um, and what you find is that that clustering is very statistically significant, um, but it's surprisingly bizarre. So you'll see often a clinical isolate will look like a wine strain from South Africa. There's no reason why those two two strains should grow necessarily next to each other. And so the the similarity between um, genotype and phenotype is you know, there, but it's a little bit weaker than you might have anticipated. Uh, and so we thought, well, let's do that same analysis, but we'll do it with the HSP90 buffer reduced. And so what we decided to do um, was do that same clustering. We just compared um, basically these phylogenetic trees that you may be used to looking at um, between the, the strains uh, just by phenotype and then by phenotype with this HSP90 reservoir reduced. And what we found was that really very profoundly, now the clustering uh, in phenotype mir mirrored the clustering in genotype. So individuals or individual strains that were genetically quite related to one another looked like each other in terms of how they grew. So the wine strains looked like wine strains, the sake strains looked like sake strains, and the, the strains from human patients looked like human patient strains. Uh, and, and this gave us really some very satisfying evidence that this mechanism may have in fact left an imprint on uh, the genomes that exist, exist today, uh, really for the first time providing uh, some, some really compelling evidence uh, that, that HSP90 will influence evolution, not just in the laboratory, but, but also in nature. And uh, I guess one other piece to put it together with is a couple of pieces of work we had done done earlier. So what, we've been, what Dan and I have been talking about now is really the understanding the scope of the variation, that it's naturally occurring variation, understanding the environment can change it in the same way, understanding the actual pieces of DNA that are, that are involved in these changes. But what we had previously shown was that what, what we're talking about now in this particular paper is, is how the environment changes those traits. But what we had previously shown, which is really a very, very important part of the piece puzzle to keep in mind, is that although the initial traits depend upon the change in the environment or the change in HSP90 function, you, the organism can rapidly evolve to the point where it no longer depends upon the change in the environment. So the environment reveals a new trait, but you can evolve rather quickly to the point where, it, where it's no longer, you don't no longer need the environmental change to have that trait so that it's, it becomes what, what a geneticist would call fixed or assimilated. And uh, we had shown in fruit flies that one way you could do that was to uh, take two individuals that only showed the trait 
when they were stressed. But if you mated them together and did this several times, that eventually produced some progeny that would show that trait no matter what. And that was just because lots of different genetic variants were responsible for it. And if you got those same genetic variants together in the same progeny, then they would just have that trait robustly. And another way we had shown that it can happen is sometimes a trait uh, will change only when the environment changes. But if you then, as you had mentioned, Mark, if you acquire new mutations, you can wind up having that just that it will be manifested even when the environment doesn't change. But um, at least that, that environmentally manifested trait gives, gives the organism a chance to grow and survive in that condition and a chance to accumulate those additional mutations. So what, uh, what Dan's next uh, saga is, uh, what his, his, next, uh, his next major endeavor is going to be to actually now take those experiments that we had done in fruit flies and, and um, in, in fungi that evolved drug resistance where we showed you could actually evolve those traits to become permanent. So you could have a trait that initially depends upon the environment, but then it, through, through natural genetic selection and, and, and the addition of additional mutations, that becomes fixed. It becomes a new, firmly fixed biological trait. Now we're going to try to understand how that happens at the level of the individual molecules and the individual po uh, polymorphisms involved. So uh, he's now in, involved in selecting the organisms that initially depended upon the environment for the change, he's making them become, he's selecting them so they'll become independent of the environmental change and fix the trait, and he'll be able to sequence the genomes and figure out exactly why it happened. What, exactly. which organisms? C. elegans? Uh, oh, we're, flying, still I mean, we're still in yeast, although we, uh, you know, definitely would like to, 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 to move on as well. Um, but I think that the other point about this is that uh, this process of fixation means that the increased uh, correlation we see between genotype and phenotype when we reduce the HS390 levels um, is probably an underestimate of the importance that this mechanism has, has had in the evolution, uh, in genome evolution, um, because once we would fix the trait, we'd no longer see an HS390 dependence of the phenotype. Um, so it's really very, very exciting. That's kind of neat. That kind of explains sort of the, the both the before and after in, in the fundamental question is how does an organism stay extremely stable for such long period mm -hmm. of time and then only first you have the the new exposed phenotypes as you tighter down the hsp90 and then there's an adaptation uh, where those phenotypes become more stable after uh, mating and breeding and then you now have a stable uh, uh, in a new stable. <laughs> Absolutely Hi. right, Mark. You're very, right. very good. You brought us right back to that, that initial. <laughs> that was very adroitly done. Yes, exactly. That's the larger question that we, I, we have hoped we have contributed to. We, of course, not solved it yet, but we hope we have contributed. In a big way. Okay. In a big way. And uh, it's, it's really, really exciting. My, my, uh, one of the questions that I have in mind is, is uh, you did it by modulating in uh, the temperature and uh, and by stressing the cells with environmental stress. What do you think are the key uh, ways to modulate HSP90 out in the environment? Is it being a yeast on a dry grape, or what are the? I guess we have to look think about how yeast lives. But maybe you could answer the how is it HSP90 is is it HSP90 just modulated by being stressing the cells or it, yeah, it and, it, and it might not be only HSP90. We just think HSP90 has a, has a particularly big role to play in this. We think other protein factors are probably likely to play a role too, but it's, it's just a particularly big one. But so how, how, would this, how would its function mirror what's happening in environmental stress? Well, yeast cells, in fact, do um, change. Or they're growing out there on a, on a, on a grape in the, in the vineyard. And uh, it's it's night and it's cool and then the sun comes out and it warms up and it's a simple natural temperature fluctuation and or it drops from being on the grape that's grape that's kind of shriveled up and the sugar content is really high it falls off and it's now down sitting in a in a mud puddle and it has to survive a, a change in the amount of water in its environment and that all, all those things wind up uh, changing the way, way the way proteins fold and so it's all again this this fact that the genome. Um, is a long linear code of DNA, but what really matters is how these proteins fold up and how they fit together and how they go about doing stuff in the cell, and um, and that ability of the the proteins to fold is is profoundly influenced by HSP90 and and by the environment. 
Do you think it's the main pathway? Would you be willing to say that HSP90 is the main um, evolutionary capacitor? Or no. uh, do, pro, do you think <laughs> grounds are going to be an important contributor? And at what percentages are the various? Not yet, but oh, we're looking. That, that, yeah. <laughs> we're looking. Yeah, I mean, I think this is really one of the, the big questions out there, right? I mean, I think just anecdotally from the, the data that we've accumulated over you know, now, now decades, that there does appear to be something special about HSP90, but we, we're really going about trying to systematically ask whether that's true. Um, at, yeah, and I, I mean, I think and, the, the relationship to the environment is really especially provocative. Um, but I, I'm sure that there will be other factors that contribute uh, at least somewhat to the same same phenomenology. We, we think that there, I, I personally feel that there's going to be a lot of them, that um, this is a big one, it's an important one, um, and its effects are big enough that you, we can actually see it by manipulating just this one. But first of all, I, as, as you know, Mark, we've done a previous a podcast on prions, which we've also mm -hmm. been working on, and these these fungi, and those are proteins that change their fold depending upon the environment. They also change the manifestation of genetic variation, and those we think are pretty cool too. And then there's um, a variety of other proteins that we call intrinsically disordered proteins that we think might have a big effect, and and certainly a lot of other people are uncovering some other amazing um, ways in which the environment can influence the evolution of new traits. For example, it's recently been shown that. Um, that uh, there's a change in the there's certain pieces of DNA that are that are uh, ancient viruses that used to be invading our genomes and have kind of hidden themselves in the in the DNA, and those things can start to pop out when the when the environment changes, and so they can they can change genetic variation in a heritable way too. So I think that there's I think that this is important and it provides a plausible mechanism by which you can link changes in the environment to a rapid uh, uh, evolutionary change because it's it's actually affecting the way lots of different proteins fold and the way lots of different genetic variants all at the same time how they can manifest a particular phenotypic trait and so it's it's a very um, I think it's it's provides a very plausible realistic natural uh, explanation for how the environment can influence the evolution of new traits rapidly but I I have the I just feel I have an amazing um, I, I'm awestruck by evolution what evolution can do and the cleverness of the biological systems um, and and I, I actually think there's going to be many many other other ways in which this can occur well HSP 90 wasn't it just didn't just appear it probably took a billion years for HSP90 to appear. There was there, yeah, there must have been strikingly, a, it's strikingly conserved actually throughout throughout evolution. Yeah. So it's but, it, early, but it had a big change early. in its importance in, in what you'd call the eukaryotic organisms and the prokaryotic organisms. It's it's interesting. It it um, it seems to shun when organisms change to be a little bit more complicated. The eukaryotic the eukaryotic cell type. HSP90 suddenly took on a much greater importance, and I think it's because they were starting to use all these regula combinatorial regulatory factors in, in ways that simpler organisms didn't use. But that's certainly at least a, a more than a billion years of evolution that we think HSP90 has been having this role. And it, it might also have been playing this role earlier on in, um, in, in bacteria, too. Hard, well, harder to tell in bacteria. HSP90 <laughs> But before we'd before it. HSP 98, it's prions. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. You've heard it here first. And uh, this is fantastic. Uh, what a great story. I, you know, I think it's time to write a book and to put your stamp on it. And for the next 200 years, people will be challenging this one. I think this is it. <laughs> well, there's lots of challenges. And, it, and, and that's really actually well, one of the great things about biology is when, when you're challenged, it inspires you to, to work harder and to, to look, look more closely. And so this whole story of, of Dan's really came about because we were being challenged by a lot of yeah. people. And it's, uh, it's really part of the natural fabric of the way biology moves. Well, that's fun. Isn't it more fun when you, uh, you, you're challenged? I mean, and, it is, and so, yeah. oh, of course. as long as it right. doesn't get to be too mean. You can handle it. By the way, I, I wanted to ask you um, what it was like. So uh, you won the National Medal of Science, and this was in, in 2009, and it, it was awarded in 2010. Mm -hmm. How, tell me about the, uh, what it was like to go to the White House. Was this the first time you'd met a president? Oh, y yes. <laughs> I don't normally <laughs> travel in those circles. Yeah, it was it was just great fun, and and uh, one of the one of the amazing things about it. Well, 
was the fact that my my kids and my husband and my brothers were there and um it was just such a such an exciting moment um you know i'm i came from a very middle class family in the midwest and um certainly my parents had never gone to college and certainly never really uh, was raised in a way to expect that I was going to go on and achieve something important like this. And I, I will have to say it was just an absolute thrill. Thrill. My heart was beating. <laughs> beating. <laughs> well, I was cheering. Really I was, was cheering. A, it was a thrill. So. That's amazing. Um, so, well, congratulations um, for both uh, the project uh, to both of you, and uh, congratulations for the uh, for the award. That uh, it's it's inspiring, and I, I really appreciate the fact that you're asking, you're while you're studying life sciences, you're asking some some of the the trickier questions um, as to you know who we are, how we are, and you know how we got here, and it's the how we got here is that extra little part that I, I think is really exciting and we'll be uh, following your work uh, for Thank years you. Can, to come. Can I say one more quick little thing and I, I think sure. that, that it's, uh, you, you're absolutely right, we, we really are trying to understand the basic mechanisms but I think one of, one of the additional motivating factors is that understanding how these things work actually I think will, will matter to mankind, it'll matter in terms of, of uh, we understanding in, in better ways how cancers evolve because cancers are an amazing um, biological evolution uh, process where they constantly changing and evolving new phenotypes and understand things like how drug resistance evolves but also you know maybe potentially we'll be able to evolve organisms to be able to use use uh, biofuels uh, more efficiently and 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 just by understanding how the process of evolution works it, it might be actually used for for the purpose of, of bettering the human condition sometime and uh, I think that although we we always focus on the basic questions, there there's there is that that um, inspiration at hand too. Well, we haven't covered that show yet. We've covered a little <laughs> bit of uh, how prions can modulate. You'd uh, be a protein-based uh, uh, method for uh, information to be passed on from uh, cell to cell. So an epigenetic, uh, non-Mendelian uh, gene of sorts. Uh, we've covered. Uh, Nanobiotech with you on our first episode. We and that episode was largely on the HSP90 work as well, but some of the early stages. So this episode we talked about um, how HSP90 can have a, a global um, capacity and verifiable in yeast uh, on, on terms of yeast's ability to adapt and, and maintain those new adaptations. So uh, coming up uh, and <laughs> perhaps in the, uh, next year because this has almost been a year since you uh, you came on uh, for episode 57 so maybe uh, next uh, February perhaps it was like 11 months we can start talking about uh, the next big project uh, and how uh, <laughs> cancer and evolution are tied and interlinked uh, we'll, we'll keep our eyes on on what's going on um, this, this is really great um, so our, I'd like to thank you for being on the show it, uh, uh, our guests were Dr. Susan Linquist, who's a professor of biology at MIT, an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Uh, thank you very much for coming on. And uh, Danielle uh, Jarose, who's a postdoctoral fellow at the Whitehead Institute at MIT. Thank you guys. Thank this you so much a, for having us. Great questions. Yeah, and you, you helped us keep us on track there very importantly. So <laughs> thanks a lot. Um, hey, I've got one last thing that I'd like to, uh, I've got a picture here that I'm going to put up if I can. All right. So. While you're still here, if you guys can guess, then I'll, I'll have to come up with another question next week. But if you guys can guess what that picture is, I'm going to uh, send me an email at mark, M-A-R-C, at twit.tv. And I will be giving uh, away a book called Food Fray by Lisa uh, Weasel. And it was the book that we talked, uh, is, it's, it sort of discusses the pros and cons of genetically modified foods. And it was episode uh, 39, Lisa was on the show. So if you can figure out what this was, uh, what this picture is, it was taken in the lab today, um, I will send you the book, the first person who finds out what it is. But I'll, I'll give uh, uh, Dr. Linquist and uh, Charles first dibs. Do you guys, can you figure out what it is? Uh, I really have not very Ooh. much of a oh. clue, but I would guess maybe a, a fish eye. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> no, it looks All like right. Uh, the, the, down the rabbit hole in Alice in Wonderland. I'm not sure. <laughs> it's well. It's has. It's. I'll give it one clue. It's an instrument or a piece of equipment ah, or. I was. I was wondering material. whether it was biological when you said the lab. I thought 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 yeah. biology, but yeah. It almost um, looks like an oil covered objective. This, I didn't, that, uh, it's a tool yeah. used in biophysics. 
Uh, uh, it's it's not an objective. <laughs> <laughs> Send me an email at mark and the RC at twit.tv and you will get the book. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Bert McQuinn for handling the audio and video boards today and the recordings and the team that make this possible Lisa, uh, Lisa Kenza, Leo Laporte, Frederick Louis, Eileen Rivera, Tony Wang, Mike Taylor, uh, John Slanita, Jeff Stewart, and Jason Howell, um, and the rest of the team in Petaluma. Um, lastly, I'd like to thank Phil Pelche and Will Hall for the opening and closing themes. If you have any comments or suggestions, again, you can email me at markmrc at twit.tv or on Twitter at, uh, at M-A-R-C-P-E-L-L-E-T-I-E-R, Mark Pelletier. For Futures in Biotech, I'm Mark Pelletier.